Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and joining me in studio today are two of our favorite panelists. We've got Phil and Shane in the house. So introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about you before we take off. Phil, we'll start with you. I'm Phil Nixon. I'm a retired extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. And uh, entomologist means insects or bugs, so I can handle those types of questions and uh, maybe something else too, who knows. Excellent, all right, Shane? And I'm Shane Coulter, I'm a retired horticulturalist. I uh, am one of the owners of Country Arbor's Nursery, but my brother and family are doing a great job there now while I sleep and rest <laughs> and play in the garden. And so I get to do all the things that I get to talk to everybody else about, I'm getting to do myself now. Yeah, so. and you've been traveling a lot too. I have I'm seen, like, hey Shane, you wanna come in and record? Can't, I'm in so-and-so. I got three springs. That was one of the most exciting things I had this year, <laughs> my grass fell. Um, yeah, so I got to see our spring, and then I went and saw Aspen Spring, and then I saw Leadville spring so I got to see le sea level wow. then 6,000 feet and then 10,000 feet so I saw the lilac bloom three times it was absolutely Can't just a perfect spring living yeah. your best life absolutely love that love that okay let's jump in on the uh, items that you guys brought Phil we'll start with you and uh, you are the a member or president what is your status I'm president of the bonsai president. society of central Illinois which meets on the University of Illinois campus on the uh, first Tuesday of the month at seven in the evening. So uh, uh, the plant sciences lab, so drop by and see us sometime. Do you have fine. to have a bonsai to get in? Nope, and there... you don't even have, don't have to own one, just have some interest in it. We have some people that have come just to find out, uh, actually some people of oriental origin who uh, wanted to get back to roots a little bit by learning about bonsai. So uh, okay. I didn't have any, been always wondered about I hear you actually do these things. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> they are really, really interesting. Uh, but uh, brought in, uh, this is a crepe myrtle. Actually, it's a myrtleette, they call it. It's a, uh, it's a smaller form of the regular crepe myrtle. It has smaller branching, has a, has a smaller trunk. Uh, does branch a little bit better than a, than a typical crepe myrtle does. And it has smaller leaves. Uh, the, the leaf, uh, the flower, uh, Bracts or the flowers are are a little bit uh, a little bit smaller too, but uh, it's a good size for a bonsai or a tree in a pot. And uh, this is one that I bought, I believe, at uh, at uh, a uh, nursery down by Effingham uh, about eight years ago or so. It's called a myrtleette. It's actually a smaller version of a crepe myrtle, like I said, and uh, it happened to be in bloom. So I thought I'd bring it along to show that. Uh, you know, you can have bon the typical bone size you tend to think about are going to be uh, uh, pines and, and mm -hmm. spruces and junipers and so on. But there's a bunch of us that are interested in uh, deciduous tree bonsai. And uh, some of those will bloom and, and uh, put on quite a show. So uh, this, isn't a, this is a plant that is not hardy in most of the Midwest, only in the southern part of the Midwest, essentially from... Uh, I-70 South probably would be a good good clue as far as when you where you might be able to grow that, and uh, and they do have crepe myrtles that are sold in nurseries that are quote hardy in in zone five, which is the central part of the Midwest. Uh, but uh, now this what they call hardy leaves. is is that it will grow during the summer and then freeze down to the ground in the winter and come back up. And so uh, this one did not do that. This one's been uh, above ground and going well for a number of years. So it's good to, it's probably hardy down to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, I would guess. And so we overwinter it in a, um, in a little greenhouse we have that's, uh, they actually want to see me. Yes. Uh, DJ says, scoot that over just a little over bit. a little bit so we can see. <laughs> uh, I think you actually have time to look at my mug later. So this later. will drop leaves? This will drop this, its leaves? It, it will drop its leaves, uh, or it may keep them on. It just depends. If it gets a little bit of a cold snap, it will it will tend to drop its leaves. It's primarily deciduous. Uh, but, uh, and even if it does keep its leaves, it will tend to push out the old leaves or the new leaves as mm -hmm. it comes on in the spring. So, so yeah, it really is deciduous, although it can hang on to its leaves. Uh, so we have a little greenhouse that we keep to where the temperature doesn't get any lower than, than the high 20s on, 
on sub zero nights so so it is it stays healthy and good in that situation it does need a winter period it cannot survive really very long which is only being in a tree that's a tropical plant so it's a it's it's kind of a difficult one for here but it's really kind of special it's part of the fun right? and part of the fun yeah anytime any any gardener as they mature gets to point of trying to grow things that they should never try to grow to see if they can do it well it's all in the search of having something that somebody else doesn't have and the reason they don't have it is because it normally does not grow right yeah and somehow you're you're going to be the one that gets it to grow the miracle worker you're the the yard that nobody else has so this is one of the more challenging this would be a challenging type of bonsai primarily because of its winter needs. If you do not have a cold greenhouse, you could you could kind of get by with once it once it got to where the the elite it got into the cold and the leaves were no longer functioning, you could move it into a a garage. Mm -hmm. If it's an attached garage, normally those aren't going to freeze or very little base barely freeze inside. Or a crawl space would be another way in which a person could do it. If it doesn't have any leaves, it doesn't need any light. Okay. It's kind of a good rule of thumb. I was just going to say that's a good rule of thumb. So probably not the best for beginners. Not a beginner plant. All right. But certainly kind of a wowy type thing. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. All right, Shane, we're to you. Yeah, well, I have, I brought one of my favorite grasses. So the great thing that as opposed to the bonsai that we just saw, ornamental grasses are about as easy to grow as any, anything we have in Illinois. But I want to make it challenging because there are a couple grasses that are borderline <laughs> hardy. Oh. And this one is a miscanthus, so it's very similar to a lot of the grasses you see. But there's two varieties called uh, Cabaret and Cosmopolitan. And they look very similar. Cosmopolitan, which is this one, has green in the middle and white on the outside. And Cabaret has white on the inside and green. So they look, from a distance, they look pretty similar until you get up close. But they are in that 5B, which is normally... Mm -hmm kind of the zone we're in, but as we all talk about all the time, we don't know what zone, where zone's kind of moving a little bit. So it's getting a little easier to grow as we go. As time passes, our zones are getting a little warmer. It's really good for the backyard. So if you have a, an enclosed backyard or you have a, an area that you have other plants, this grass is perfect. If you're out in the middle of the country and you want a windbreak, maybe not the best choice for you, but it does have these beautiful plumes. Mm -hmm. It gets six or seven feet tall and wide. And so, and it just has a huge splash of color. And I use it as a backdrop against a fence and then I have some hydrangeas in front of it because um, it gives a little, a little protection from the sun because it's big enough. It's six foot, seven foot, but, and that is wide. You're just getting a plant that, that provides structure and also can provide a little shade for something underneath it. And then in the fall, it just takes one step up in beauty with these fronds and uh, it's just a really nice plant, but again, Everybody wants to put it out as a windbreak because they'll see that individual plant and it just is more of a specimen, stick it in a more protected area in the back. Two questions. Yeah. Number one, when you uh, can you divide this you like can. in clumps? Grasses, if anybody's ever divided a big grass, it is one of the most difficult yeah. things to dig up. Yes. It's like digging a tree. Yes. It is <laughs> brutal. So we'll have customer to say, hey, could you just dig up that little grass and move it over there? And I go, well, why don't I just dig out the oak tree? Because it's essentially <laughs> the same amount of work. But yes, it can be. Once you get it up, a hatchet, a sawzall, Saws all the yeah. time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Something to cut it up. And um, it, is, it is a good time to do it. Um, but one of the things about grasses is they don't root up really well later in the season. So mm -hmm. September is getting to be the time when you really want to start planting your grasses. If you're going to have died, you want to do it now. It's probably best to do it in August or even earlier. But if you're going to plant grasses, so if you come out to the nursery and you pick up a grass, I'd like to see that done before first week in October. You can get it later with some super hardy ones, but this being a little more temperamental, the sooner the better to get okay. those in. So okay. you said you had a second question? Second question, do you leave that up over the winter months? Because I've heard a lot of people talk yeah. about the ornamental I, I like the ornamental. There are some grasses um, that tend to break off and cause problems where the fronds get all dirty and they're all over the yard. This one is strong enough, it never moves. And so I leave it on until the first signs of green in the spring. Mm. So once I see some green, I bring that Sawzall that Phil lets me borrow, and I just <laughs> cut it across. 
and, and cut that grass down and let that new grass take over. And one more secret, occasionally we'll have grasses that die out in the middle. So you get mm -hmm. that ring where you have the middle dead. I'll take a post hole digger, I'll dig out that middle and I'll plant the same grass in that same spot. So I'll, it, it's a lot of work because you know digging up that grass is difficult. But if you can get that middle out where it's dead, I'll just put in some more soil, plant a new grass in there, and then that fills in so the grass is the same size as it was before. Okay, and then so next year, um, you know, does the clump get larger? Do it they, doubles, essentially it doubles. doubles in size every year. Wow. And that's, this one's I've had 18 years, so it's an incredibly large, and wow. you can see it from everywhere. The reason people can, they can see it from the, the walking path into my backyard and people ask me, what is that grass back there? <laughs> it's amazing how many people will knock on my door and ask what a plant is. Wow. Which either says that I look friendly or that plant's pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. Either one, yeah, because I've one done it too. too. I've yeah. done it too. If you see something that catches your eye, you just have to know what it is. And you're just praying that they're a gardener, that they just didn't plant it or the landscaper <laughs> didn't put it in. They'll be like, I don't know. And I go, well, get out the identifier thing. Yes. Like that's the apps and and. Or again, I bring Phil. I say, hey, Phil, can I get your Sawzall and you to come over here and help me? I'll just take a little piece of it with me. Figure out what this plan is, yeah. All right, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Phil, you send in some pictures of insects, as you love to do. So oh, yes. take it away. Well, when they're small, it's kind of hard to do a show and tell. So uh, and thank goodness this for is that. one of the <laughs> smallest ones you're ever gonna run across. This is a banded white fly, as you can see by the uh, adult on to the left in the screen. Uh, this one has two horizontal dark bands running across its wings. And this is a white fly which lives on a, a common weed, buttonweed or velvet leaf, it's commonly referred to. Uh, kind of a very large leaves, looks almost tropical, uh, has uh, almost heart-shaped leaves uh, that are very uh, velvety and smooth on top. And these will live on the underneath side and build up to very high numbers by, by the late summer, early fall. And from there then they have a tendency to fly around and move around. We also have a close relative of it, which is the silver leaf white fly that, uh, that, will, uh, that will end up uh, uh, getting on leaves. And, and uh, somewhere I did send in a picture that showed it on a leaf, but uh, we, there it is. There we go. And, uh, and essentially this is, gives you an idea of the size. This is a hibiscus leaf, which would be probably, oh, about five inches long, four inches long. So you can get an idea of the size. But they're for the most part about pinhead size, and and uh, to be frank about it, I got the idea by sitting in my yard yesterday, and I could see the white fly adults flying by my my face. So uh, they are out. They look like uh, uh, pinhead sized little uh, white pieces of fluff that are just kind of floating along. They don't. They're not real strong flyers. And they will show up on essentially every plant that you have. But important thing to realize is that you don't, usually you only get these as a problem uh, late summer, early fall. They're more of a tropical insect or subtropical and actually do better in greenhouses. Even large numbers like you see here are even four or five times this amount are unlikely to cause any serious damage because they're only at the point where they're going to be doing adult feeding, which is primarily a, a maintenance type feeding. You know, you're eating enough to keep yourself going, keep yourself alive. Uh, when they're young ones, when they're nymphs on, on the leaves and, and they look just a little like flat spots on the leaves, uh, those individuals will do a lot of damage sucking up the juices because they're getting enough to grow on. It's kind of like having teenagers versus adults in the house. Uh, you go through a lot more food with the youngsters yes. that are growing. And so, uh, and so they, they can do damage, but thankfully in, in the Midwest, we really, in America, we only really have this, these insects showing up in very high numbers uh, in the fall of the year when it's really too late mm -hmm. in the year. The, the, the plants are no longer needing those leaves very much and they're not feeding heavily enough in high enough numbers to cause any real serious damage. And some, a lot of people get upset about them. They see all these white bugs that fly out uh, when they get in around their garden. You'll see them a lot on tomatoes, for instance, uh, a lot on squash, watermelon. They'll just be heavier than can be on those. But they're really not gonna cause any much harm at this time of the year 
because the plants are kind of scaling down. They're filling out those fruit and, uh, and they don't really, and these insects are not causing a lot of damage. And of course, the ones that are abandoned wing, which feed only on a weed uh, in, our, in our garden, we don't need to really worry a whole lot about them. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this is all a, a case of, of uh, live and let live. If you see the little white specks or, or pinhead size white insects around or on your plants, don't worry about it. If you feel you have to do something, use some insecticidal soap or just literally wash them off with a stream of water mm -hmm. if that makes you feel better. But, uh, but they're not really. They're not really causing any harm. It's, it's too late, too little time to do anything. So <laughs> okay. And they don't don't, you really said they don't bother them. the fruit or the vegetable. It's more so the leaves. It's on the leaves is what so. they're on. Mm -hmm. uh, we do get these. Some people will buy... Uh, transplants in the spring mm -hmm. and uh, and many of those transplants are grown in Georgia, Alabama, areas in the south and they will and they will get attacked by these silver leaf white flies then. And there you are in a case of where you need to be probably spraying the undersides mm -hmm. of the leaves uh, in weekly. In the greenhouses we with, have that issue. Yeah, for... weekly with an insecticidal soap to knock them back. Otherwise they can really kill your young tomato seedlings and, yeah. and make it so you have a poor crop. You end up with fruit that are that are undersized and have yellow spots all over them and things like this. They're just not they're just not getting the nutrient that they mm -hmm. need because it's being sucked out by these guys on the leaves. Or in the case of a grower, you just have a crop you can't sell. Yeah, mm. yeah. Nobody will buy them <laughs> yeah. when they're carpeted with white yeah, on the yeah, underside. Yeah. And, and when you pick it up, it goes. Yeah, oh, and that's what it is. When you brush it, it just they just fog the, out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. It's a sign but we this don't time like. of year, you know. Worry about something that's important about whether that oak tree is going to turn the right color of leaf or not. Just worry about those sorts of things. Live Don't worry and let about live for this yeah. one. Okay, fair enough. All right, Shane, we're back to you. And uh, yeah, if you've been if you've been watching, you know that Shane's got lots of new hobbies. Well, that's exactly right. right? I, I was addicted to honey coming into this, and now that I have more time, I'm more addicted to honey. And I actually just brought you gifts. I really didn't plan on talking about it, but. It is one of my favorite honeys, and it's blackberry honey. And blackberry honey is the only honey that tastes like the fruit. So everybody sees these honeys that are based on the flowers of mm -hmm. all these fruits. Mm -hmm. But the flower doesn't really take on the fruit taste. Uh, and an orange might have a zest to it, and a cranberry might have a little tinge at the end of it. But in general, it's not. Blackberry is different. It tastes like blackberry jam. So it's... It is everything that you would get from a spreadable jam, but in honey form. So you Yum. can put it on your biscuits. And so I love bringing it to people because I think I put something in it. And this is literally from the hive, strained and not touched at all, not heated, nothing. And that's the flavor that comes out. And, and it's just amazing that nature can put out a flavor like that. Wow. So did you, how did you orchestrate this. Yeah, Did so you... this is a, another story I liked it. So I was introduced by Maggie, uh, who's a very popular beekeeper in this area, to a, uh, an apiary out um, on the East Coast that takes truckloads of bees and goes to crops. So mm. they go to the, the lime and the oranges and the cranberry. So the people that produce these fruits and they bring the bees to help pollinate to have better yields. And what you get because of that is bees don't care where they go. So if they see blackberry, that's great, but they're going to go over here and go to a maple or whatever else. So the flavors are very mixed, but when you have an apiary that goes and does one giant crop, so you do hundreds of acres of one type of plant, the honey is particular to that gotcha. plant. And you just don't find that very often. And so she's introduced me to them. And so when they have their honeys, they are pure of a plant, whatever they're traveling really to go. Cool. And the result is they're, you know, they make their money by, by providing their bees and the honey is a gift that they get. And, and so they do sell it to help support themselves. And I'm the man to take it. And, <laughs> and there's just, there's not very much. I mean, I think, and this is a huge operation and I think they had 600, 700 pounds of blackberry. Oh so gosh. it's really not that much um, honey. So it's really good. And I found sourwood in Appalachian area too. That is like gold They will, to find the sourwood. And it's a sweet honey. It, it says sourwood, but it's actually a very sweet honey. Mm. So it's just, I know people don't geek out on this kind of stuff, but when you, <laughs> to find very unique flavors that I can put out, I call it a flight, a flight of honey. And after you've tasted them, you can come back and say exactly what every single one is. You know, wow. a distinct flavor. To me, that's exciting. 
You're and really loving retirement, I aren't do. You? I do. I used to see how much honey I use. Sugar is gone from my house. Everything is just Everything squeezing is honey, honey on it. So I, you'll see once I give you a, a little taste of all that stuff. I brought you some bottles. So. Excellent. And one more thing. My biggest fan has moved into town, into the viewing area. And I just want to say, Mom, thank you for watching. She's been hasn't gotten to see me live or in Aww. kind of while she lived in town. So she's a huge fan. She talks about all of you. Someday I'll have to bring her into the studio so that she can meet. But she's one of the reasons that I love garden. Of course, my father's in the business, but my mom always had that perennial garden. My mom had the perennial garden in the 70s. The things that are so popular now, my mom had in she was above, stages, ahead of the trend. flowers. She, lo she loves this town because our town here is just loving horticulture and loving plants and she is in we heaven. We would love to have her in the yeah, studio so, so you're welcome. Thank anytime. you mom for everything. Yes. <laughs> Another flavored honey that's that's fairly common as you get in the south and I did this I was down there uh, on, on a trip and uh, drove by an area and they had were selling Tupelo honey yep. and it was like $18 a pound. Yeah. Now, typically, honey's going to be a dollar and a half, right, two bucks, right. something like that. That's the good uh, stuff. Was, but this was stuff that was, uh, right, it, was it. it was just like uh, you normally would see in a, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Midwest where somebody's selling uh, selling uh, yeah. sweet corn out of the back of their truck or, or pumpkins. These were selling Tupelo honey out of the back of a pickup, an old broken down pickup. And Tupelo is the only fortune. honey that doesn't crystallize. Really? So it's okay. the only, so if somebody sells you real pure Tupelo, it shouldn't ever crystallize. Well, make a mess here. It's, uh, it's, that's the great thing about Tupelo. And, and of course, Tupelo is a swamp tree. It grows mm. in, the, in mm -hmm. the swampy areas. And so in order to get the, that, that honey, you have to put the beehives down in that area when they're blooming and pull them out when they're no they, longer they blooming because something else wow. is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, That's you really actually good. have to go into the swamp to get these things. And so it uh, commands a high price. Uh, if you uh, if you remember uh, back years ago, there was a, uh, a movie called Yuli's Gold. And, and Yuli's Gold was one of his gold that was in the movie. It was Peter Fonda in the movie <laughs> and uh, it was Tupelo honey and he was selling it by the 55 gallon drum yeah. and making his entire living off of selling Tupelo honey. <laughs> All right, it's we've, a, it's we've, a got prize to, we've got we've got to move on to the butterflies. Yeah. I, we, oh, yeah, we, yeah. we can't we can't end the show you without this. You can't have a show without butterflies. Um, hey, we anytime, you know, we're guys, we'll talk about honey. Okay? I know yeah, it, I we're know sweet. it, but yeah. <laughs> we're we're about to experience the great migration, yes? That's right. Okay. And uh, we actually saw, a, a, my wife saw an accumulation in our yard uh, south of Champaign just uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, this is a time when the monarch butterflies are amassing. Uh, they will mass together into small groups, which will then coalesce into larger groups, which will then take off and fly. And, uh, and they will migrate uh, down uh, throughout, uh, essentially, uh, anywhere west of the Appalachian Mountains and east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, up in, all the way up into Canada, will all amass and migrate down into a small area of mountainous Mexico that has the, uh, the right climate, the right trees to, to, uh, to sit in to overwinter, to spend the winter. And uh, the same butterfly that may have, may have grown up in the southern part of a Canadian province will fly all the way to where you see the dot end in central Mexico, the arrow's end. So uh, ours go to Texas? Ours go to, ours go to Mexico. Oh, yeah. Mexico, okay. Ours go all Northern the way to Mexico. All the way, gotcha. The whole way. Gotcha, okay? gotcha. So Midwestern ones go all the way down. On the East Coast, they go to Florida. On the West Coast, they go to some areas around St. Louis Obispo and other areas south of San Francisco even as far south as the Baja and, and so on. Uh, they have several different places there, but they all go to one place in Mexico, an area that's several squ uh, many square miles. The ones that go back only make it into Texas. Gotcha. And so you can see in the, in the graphic that's on your screen, those dark ones that go up and end in southern Texas, that's essentially where all of our butterflies die. If they if they are successful, because <laughs> they will lucky. go down all the way to the south. <laughs> Terrible success. They will spend the winter 
They will get up there into southern Texas. They will lay, mate and lay eggs, and, uh, and then they die. And it's their kids that come on up into Oklahoma, and their kids that come on up into southern Illinois, and their kids that go on up in through Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, and their kids that go on up into Minnesota. You get the idea. Get the and their idea. kids that make it all the way to, to, to uh to, to Canada. So it's four or five generations before they get to Canada, but then they all come back down to Mexico. Wow, that's fascinating. And one of the interesting features that you end up wondering is there are several generations remote from those that were in Mexico. How do they know where to go? How do they know where to go? There's so a Nobel Prize in that answer. Interesting. If you know. Uh, but if you want to go back to the one that shows the butterflies, yes, we've got about a minute they left. Will, they will show up. And where they're normally sitting is, is sat with closed wings like this. Most of the time, they don't have their wings open. And so you kind of look at the way you identify a, a, a mass is that it looks like the leaves are, are kind of turning yellow on a tree or something. And you get closer enough, and you realize you're looking at the backside of the monarch wings. And that's how you kind of identify them. That's the way I've identified them. I go, what's wrong with those trees? They, they got a disease or something, or they're turning yellow early or something in the fall. And uh, you get close enough, and it's and it's monarchs, and it's hundreds. Okay. Of them. If you really look close, you can see Google Maps that they're all going over the map to get home. <laughs> yeah, you've got to go in a little bit. All right, right. that know, is our show, they gentlemen. Have really tiny iPads. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, send them in to us at yourgarden at gmail.com, and we will see you next time. Good night.